Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. Up above the world so high, like a diamond in the sky. You knew that verse, right? Uh, 20 bucks if you know the third verse. Then the traveler in the dark thanks you for your tiny spark. He could not see where to go if you did not twinkle so. Uh, 1806 poem, Jane Taylor. Uh, it was true in 1806 and 2016, not so much. Why? Because we have a constellation of 24 satellites in six different orbital planes and an altitude of 12,400 miles that circled the earth at a speed of 8,640 miles per hour. All 24 satellites circle the earth twice a day, uh, sending signals to radar stations all around the world from Ascension Island in the South Atlantic to Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean to Shriver Air Force Base in Colorado uh, to uh, cesium and two rubidium atomic clocks keep those signals in sync. They're so accurate that if left unadjusted, they would not gain or lose more than one second in 160,000 years. Uh, long story short, GPS is accurate to four meters. Unbelievable, right? Unbelievable. Uh, and yet we plug a destination into our phone. GPS gives us multiple routes, time, traffic, mid-course corrections. And we take it for granted uh, unless, of course, we lose cell signal, in which case we're totally incapacitated. <laughs> and that's why we have a tough time reading the Christmas story in Matthew 2 and fully appreciating what the wise men pulled off. In the first century, the average person never traveled outside a 30-mile radius of their birthplace. Now, we're not entirely sure whether it was Near East or Far East, but I think the best bet is ancient Babylon. That's 500 miles as the crow flies to Bethlehem. And the most common route along the Euphrates River, we're talking about 900 miles, just to put that in perspective. In the 10th century, Eric the Red sailed almost 1,000 miles from Norway to Iceland. And then another 750 miles from Iceland to Greenland. Pretty impressive. Uh, and it was over water, and I don't want to discount that. But 1,000 years earlier, the wise men travel the same distance. And by the way, if I'm choosing between a ship and a camel, I'm choosing a ship seven days a week and twice on hump day. This is an epic journey, an epic journey. Now, the Christmas story is an amazing story. And I think uh, the primary plot line is this, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But there are also subplots in this story. And that's what we've been talking about during this series. Uh, the shepherds, are a subplot. Uh, Joseph is a subplot. And this weekend we zoom in on the wise men. I think it's one of the craziest subplots in scripture. Let me get this straight. Some Eastern astrologers are studying the stars and the stars reveal the birth of the Messiah. And this is how God chooses to reveal himself to humankind. We, we would not script the story, that this is not how it's supposed to happen. But I'll tell you this, the second you think you have God figured out, he will throw a curveball. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. What I mean by that is he is still predictably unpredictable. And he's big enough to be found by Eastern astrologers living along. See, we, we want a God in a box, right? A God that we can control, a God that we can comprehend with our uh, linear left brain. Uh, we, we want a God whose command is our wish, but that's a genie in a bottle. That's not God. And there's something about this Christmas story that I think is supremely encouraging. I think it's gonna encourage your heart this weekend. God is big enough to be found. Uh, Matthew chapter two, if you have your Bible, you can turn there. Let me invite all eight campuses to stand and uh, let me add a welcome uh, to you. Thanks for celebrating 
uh, a week before Christmas here at National Community Church. Thrilled that you're here and uh, pray that God would meet you in this place. Matthew chapter two, verse number one. And Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from Eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn King of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem, in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel." And then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. And then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. And after this interview, the wise men went their way and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother Mary and they bowed down and worshiped him. They opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. And when it was time to leave, they returned to their country by another route. And we just, we read that as if nothing just happened. Ha, but without GP, are you kidding me? Okay, we're gonna go back by a different, let's do this again. Wow, went back by another route for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. You can be seated. A quarter century ago, Robert Fulgham wrote a little book with the long title, Everything I Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. He shared simple truisms like, put things back where you found them. Don't take things that aren't yours. Say you're sorry when you hurt somebody. Wash your hands before you eat and flush. You know, basically, lessons that wise men are still trying to learn. Yes? Okay. I want to share a simple message this weekend. Everything I need to know I learned from the wise men. Now, the truth is there are dozens of lessons embedded in this story uh, that are so good, uh, but I think we have time for about two. And so um, we're gonna keep it pretty simple and straightforward this weekend, but I think these are game changers if you take them uh, to heart. First of all, wise men still seek him. It's so cliche, but it is so true. And so let me say it a different way. Wise men go out of their way to get to God. All you need to do is compare and contrast. The Jewish religious leaders knew, based on Micah's prophecy, that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, and they live five miles away. But they aren't willing to go five miles out of their way to check it out. And then we have the wise men who have no idea where this star would lead them. They had no idea how far or how long it would take, what that tells me is this, that they were willing to go to the ends of the ancient earth to find the Messiah. They were seeking God. Let me take a, a, a calculated risk right here. I want you to listen very carefully. Uh, I believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by him. I believe that there's no other name under heaven given unto men by which you must be saved. I also believe Hebrews eleven six that God is a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. Yeah. Now, it's not my job to figure out uh, how those mesh, but uh, I do believe that God is big enough to reveal himself through the stars. And if you don't believe that, then I think your God is too small. Now, I believe it's gonna to lead to the person of Jesus Christ. But our God is so big. I read a beautiful story just a couple of weeks ago uh, that a friend of mine, Brandon, 
Hatmaker shares in his book, A Mile Wide. Uh, I thought I'd share it with you. Uh, his first trip to Ethiopia, and, and he and Jen have since adopted a couple of beautiful children from Ethiopia, but this was his first trip. Brandon was headed there uh, to work with his friend, Steve Fitch, who founded Eden Projects. Now, deforestation had devastated parts of that country because generation after generation had stripped the forest, leaving the land bare and barren. And so Brandon boards the plane, but he starts having second thoughts. I mean, first of all, he said he has a fear of flying and then the idea of leaving his family behind. And then he's thinking to himself, I mean, come on, planting trees. What, what, how much of a difference is this really going to make? And so he was feeling bad about his bad attitude. And so he decided to close his eyes uh, right there on the plane before taking off and, and pray. And this is what he prayed. He said, God, I'm sorry, I'm trying. I just don't get it. I, I don't wanna be on this plane. I feel like I'm wasting time and money. If this is important to you, will you please overcome my ignorance, doubt, and blindness? Will you connect the dots and show me what I'm missing? Amen. Opens his eyes, uh, well-dressed, 30-something Ethiopian man right next to him, uh, asks him why he's going to Ethiopia. And listen, Brandon could have given a variety of different answers. You know, he could have played the community development card, okay? Could have played the missions card. Uh, instead, Brandon just said, planting trees. So the elderly woman seated next to the 30-something man, asked this 30-something man a question in Amharic. And when he responds in Amharic, she begins to wail. She stands up, starts waving her hands in the air like she really does care. <laughs> Brandon's like, what is going on? And this man says, my mother asked me why you were going to Ethiopia. He said, what did you tell her? He said, I told her you were going to plant trees. Brandon said, what is she saying? And that's when Brandon's seatmate revealed that his mother had been praying for 38 years that God would forgive them for stripping their land bare. And she had been praying, please send someone to plant trees. She had been praying that prayer before Brandon was born. Your obedience is the answer to someone else's prayer. Sometimes when you don't even get what's going on, you might be doing something that in the grand scheme of things has an impact that's far beyond what you could ask or imagine. And I love Brandon's little revelation after he shares this story. He says, my gospel is too small. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. But God is big enough, good enough to reveal himself to anybody, anywhere, anytime. But I think the issue this weekend is, are we seeking God? If he's a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. Listen, those of us who know Jesus better be seeking him and not second or third or 10th. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of heaven and all these things will be added unto you. You know what we want? We want God to add all these things unto us. Then we'll seek you. But that's not the sequence. That's not how it works. You don't seek opportunity, you seek God, then opportunity seeks you. You make a decision uh, that you're gonna seek God first. What does that mean? I think it means that your life is gonna revolve around this pursuit of knowing Christ and not just in the power of his resurrection, but also identifying with his suffering every day in every way, a desire to know the creator of the universe and the redeemer of our souls in a new way, in a better way. So what does that look like? 
Well, let me tell you a little story and see if it helps. Uh, before Tom Brady uh, was called Tom Terrific, there was a guy named Tom Seaver. Uh, he was a major league uh, pitcher. Uh, his career spanned 20 years, compiled 311 wins, 3,640 strikeouts, 61 shutouts, a, a career 2.86 ERA. When he was inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame, um, at the time, it was by the largest percentage ever, 98.84%. How did Tom Seaver perform at that level for two decades? Here's his secret. He said, pitching determines what I eat, when I go to bed, what I do when I'm awake. It determines how I spend my life when I'm not pitching. Why? Because he's a pitcher. And so he decided that his whole life would revolve around pitch. I'm a seeker. My life needs to revolve. Why? Because there is an omnipotent, omniscient God who, listen, you can know that you know that you're saved. Okay. But he who thinks he knows does not yet know as he ought to know. 2 Corinthians 8, 2. The more you know, the more you know how much you don't know. And so you seek God even more because you wanna know more of his love, more of his power, more of his goodness. It means your life revolves around this pursuit of God. I think most of us follow God to the point of inconvenience, but no further. As long as it's comfortable, as long as it's convenient, as long as it kind of fits with our plan, uh, it's a nice addendum. But I think true discipleship really begins when it gets inconvenient. See, I, I think what you have here is a story uh, about some wise men who were not just willing to go out of their way, but go so far out of their comfort zone that uh, they would risk everything to pursue God. And I think that's who God honors. Uh, he honors tax collectors who climb sycamore trees and just to get a glimpse of, of Jesus. And that's who Jesus says, hey, can we have lunch together? Because God responds to people who go out of their way to seek him. Here's my challenge for this coming year, because I think this is at the crux of the issue. I would challenge you to seek out opportunities to inconvenience yourself for the sake of Christ. Intentionally. What am I talking about? Uh, mission trips are inconvenient. I mean, first of all, getting your passport and visa, right? Getting shots, not fun. Um, and then taking your vacation time and leveraging it. Why, why would you do that? Well, listen, it's not just to serve and love and bless the people that we're going to serve and love and bless. You know who the primary beneficiary is gonna be? You, the one who inconvenienced yourself. I found that that's where we meet God. That's where God reveals himself. That's where God does something in our lives that, that is really special and different. You wanna know it's inconvenient? The hundreds of volunteers that get up every weekend uh, to serve at National Community Church on a Sunday. You know what? I'm gonna set my alarm early in the morning. I'm gonna come serve. I mean, I, I could tell you so many different examples, but this is one that um, was just shared with me and I, and I, kinda, I kinda love it. Um, the, uh, we have a family at Potomac Yard. Um, Randy is a two-star general uh, and his wife and their son, Michael, uh, every weekend you'll find them on our hospitality team. Um, I mean, this is Pentagon brass. This is someone that, that has tremendous authority. Um, but you know what I love? That, that on the weekend, they're gonna come and they're gonna serve and they're gonna inconvenience themselves for the sake of the gospel. And I believe they would be the first ones to say we're the primary beneficiaries. Because 
the best way to help yourself is to help other people. It's loving your neighbor as yourself. When you get out of your comfort zone and begin to serve other people, God begins to do something so unique and special in our lives. Um, I would say that tithing is inconvenient. That is not financially convenient, is it? Does that first 10% fit in your budget, just giving that right back to God? Um, that's not easy to do. But you know what I found that when I inconvenience myself in these different ways, that, that God has a way of meeting me and revealing himself. And listen, please, please hear me. Your effort isn't gonna save you. You're saved by grace. Um, but we also have to work out our salvation, the Bible says, with fear and trembling. That, that we've got to give God our best effort. Whatever you do, do it um, as if your life depended on it would be the translation of Colossians 3.23. We've got to give God that best effort. I think one way we do it is by uh, meeting him at those inconvenient places. One last little thought. Uh, you tell me the last time you were uncomfortable and I'll tell you the last time you grew. Uh, I think that's true physically. Um, going to the gym is uncomfortable, but it's the only way you're gonna get your metabolism at the place it needs to be um, and keep your body in the kind of shape it needs to be in. Um, in the same way, uh, here's the deal. The key to spiritual growth is routine. And those routines are called spiritual disciplines. They're daily disciplines. But I also know that once a routine becomes routine, you have to change your routine, okay? Um, it's a law of requisite variety. If you go to the gym and work out the same way every single time, your body adapts to it. And what you need to do is confuse your body by doing an exercise you've never done before. Spiritually, um, as we head into a new year, Listen, I, I want you to practice these routines called spiritual disciplines, but sometimes you have to mix it up just a little bit. You know, one way that I do it that's pretty simple is uh, I choose a different translation of the Bible every year be because it makes my synapses fire in a little different way. So last year it was the NIV, two years ago it was the KJV, and this year I'm kind of deciding between the NLT and, and the message. And I'm not sure yet what I'm gonna do, but I started kind of gauging those two. Um, what do you need to do in the next year just to begin to, to establish routine or maybe change some of those routines? Um, you say, what are you, what are you talking about? I'm talking about seeking God. I'm talking about getting into God's word, getting into a place of prayer, learning to worship him, not just with a couple of songs on the weekend, but finding a way to leverage those moments just to worship God in your everyday life. I'll tell you this, I know this for sure. Wise men still seek him. Wise women still seek him. Let me share one other little thought with you that I hope is a challenge and an encouragement. Uh, wise men still seek him. And uh, wise men come bearing gifts. And I've talked about this a time or two, but um, it proved to be a defining moment in my life. I had a meeting with someone, first time I'd ever met with them. It was two or three years ago. And they came with a gift. It wasn't my birthday, it wasn't a holiday. Didn't know why they were bringing a gift, but when they gave it to me, uh, they said, wise men come bearing gifts. Well, far be it from me not to receive it. And I thought to myself, you know what? That's awesome. I'm gonna start doing that. Um, and so what I've done over the last couple of years is occasionally I'll go somewhere and I'll bring a gift. And, and people will be as confused as I was. And I'll say, wise men come bearing gifts and they'll give me that kind of blank stare that I gave to this guy at first. See, I think this idea of just giving gifts just because, because true joy is found on the giving. Jesus said it's better to give than it is to receive. So I wonder if this is something we could put into practice that's really epitomized by the wise men. They come bearing gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Let me give a little backstory and then 
kind of bring this thing in for a landing. Scripture doesn't reveal the full identity of these wise men, but my best guess is that they were ancient scholars who obviously studied the stars. What's fascinating is that the book of Daniel alludes to wise men uh, in Babylon 600 years before the birth of Christ. Let me try to connect those dots. Um, But first, let me tell you a story. Uh, Friday night, we uh, went to see It's a Wonderful Life that was showing uh, right in the Miracle Theater that we own and operate on Capitol Hill. And uh, it's a classic film. At the end of the movie, uh, an angel named Clarence uh, shows George Bailey, played by Jimmy Stewart, how his life altered the course of history in his little town of Bedford Falls. Now there's this moment where he goes to uh, visit the grave of his younger brother, Harry, who instead of winning the Medal of Honor during World War II for saving a transport ship, he dies at the age of eight. Why? Because George was never born, so he wasn't there to save his brother when he fell through the ice. Now, hopefully, if you haven't seen the movie, well, for, shame on you. Um, <laughs> But if you haven't, hopefully that that makes a little bit of sense. This idea that your life alters the course of history in ways that you might not be aware of. So I'm reading the book of Daniel a few weeks ago, and I had never made this connection. I realized that without Daniel, uh, we wouldn't have this part of the Christmas story. When the wise men of Babylon couldn't interpret King Nebuchadnezzar's dream, He was so ticked that in Daniel 2.12, he orders the execution of all the wise men in Babylon. But Daniel interprets the dream. And that's the part of the story that we look at. And we look at the promotion of Daniel and the way that Daniel benefited from that interpreting of the dream. But the reality is he saved all the wise men in Babylon. He stayed that execution Order. So without Daniel, we wouldn't have the wise men. And I want to be careful here, but without the wise men, I don't know that we would have Jesus. Now, trust me, I believe in the sovereignty of God and his ability to do things in different ways, okay? But just play along with me. The wise men come bearing gifts. And, you know, we have a little bit of fun with that part of the story. I remember reading the three wise women. Do you know what would happen if it had been three wise women instead of three wise men? They would have asked directions, arrived on time, helped deliver the baby, cleaned the stable, made a casserole, and brought practical gifts. (laughs) And so we poke fun at the wise men a little bit, right? I mean, come on. Are your kids asking for myrrh? (laughs) No, I mean... Get the poor kid an ancient Jewish action figure, right? Like, what kind of gifts are these? But how does a minimum wage carpenter afford a trip to Egypt in the middle of the night with his wife and newborn baby because he's warned in a dream that Herod's going to kill all the children under the age of two in Bethlehem? Especially considering the fact that he just broke open his piggy bank to pay his taxes. I'll tell you how. Gold, Uh, that currency will work in Israel. It'll work in Egypt. It'll work anywhere. I I think it's not going too far to say that that gift um, made all the difference for this flight to Egypt uh, where they lived as refugees for quite a time. Uh, Your gift is someone else's miracle. Are you tracking the domino effect that's happening? I just think that this story is more miraculous than we give it credit for. Let me bring it a little closer to home. Over the past two months, more than a thousand NCCers have given uh, just under $600,000 to the DC Dream Center. Uh, We're only 36,000 away from hitting that $615,000 goal. And it might be appropriate for us to stop and just praise God right there. Um, I 
I want to say a huge thank you uh, to each and every one of you who made an investment in that Dream Center. And I'd say on a, on a larger scale, just a genuine thank you for your investment in this thing called National Community Church. I want you to understand um, that, that I believe that, uh, that that Dream Center, for example, it's gonna impact a part of our city that desperately needs it. Um, how is God gonna do it? He's gonna do it one person at a time. And we're believing that God is gonna do miracles in kids' lives as we love them and serve them and mentor them. And ultimately what we're believing for is that God would reveal his dream for their lives. And that God would raise up a generation of Daniels and Esthers and Nehemiahs who, who would make a difference in their generation. I want you to know that uh, each miracle that happens, you're a shareholder as you give towards that pride, your gift is someone else's miracle. Come on, we've got to start connecting the dots. Wise men come bearing gifts. Let me share one last little story. A few Christmases ago, Laura was out at Potomac Yard shopping and uh, got a flat tire. So I went out and changed the flat tire and brought it back to uh, a repair shop on Capitol Hill and they fixed the tire, changed the oil, did a little tune up. And uh, next day I went in to pick it up and pay for it. And uh, after running my credit card, I kind of just signed on the dotted line and uh, he handed me the keys. The only problem is they weren't the keys to my car. Uh, they were the keys uh, to the car uh, for the woman who was standing right behind me who was picking up her car. And uh, I don't know what prompted it. It was just kind of a split second decision. I just turned to her and said, hey, Merry Christmas. Your repair is paid for. And she started bawling in the gas station. I'll be on it, a little awkward. <laughs> you, you need to understand, it was $41, which should have been the tip off that it wasn't my repair, Okay. We're not talking about a big deal. I, I don't know what was happening. I, I, I don't know if she literally couldn't afford that repair or if it had just been forever since someone had just done something for her that was kind of unexpected. But, but whatever it was, I think in that moment, I discovered that, man, this idea of just bringing a gift is such a simple thing, but such a powerful Thing. I mean, come on, even the writer of Proverbs in Proverbs 18 says, listen, you, you want to sit with kings? Give a gift. Now, you, you can't bribe. If you do it for the wrong reason, it's going to backfire. But you know what? The Proverbs say a, a man's gift will make room for him. If you want to start having fun with this thing, listen, go ahead and get gifts for your loved ones. Can, can we just say that? Let's keep with that tradition. But if you want to start having fun, Start living a lifestyle where you start giving when it's unexpected, sometimes when it's undeserved. And as you do that, what you'll discover is that your gift is someone else's miracle. Wise men still seek him. Wise men come bearing gifts. Uh, may the spirit of God uh, seal that in our hearts this weekend and help us live it out. Uh, it, all of our campuses, I wanna invite our ushers to come. This weekend, we're gonna celebrate communion together. Uh, it's kind of our, uh, we'll have a Christmas Eve service, but last chance this year to celebrate communion as a church family. And let me just say this, uh, you don't have to be uh, a member of this church. This could be your first weekend. Um, there's one qualification for communion. And that is that uh, you have received the free gift of salvation that God has offered through his son, Jesus Christ. And you could even make that decision this weekend. Um, you know how you start seeking God? By surrendering yourself to him, by kneeling at the cross and saying, I surrender my life to, to Jesus Christ. And that begins this lifelong journey of seeking God. You can do that right here, right now. In fact, we're gonna sing a song, uh, Salvation Come. Man, this weekend, for some of you, this is not just a song. This is your declaration of faith. This is your moment 
and we're gonna celebrate communion together. Uh, we're gonna ask you to kind of hold on to the elements until everyone's been served at all of our campuses. And then your campus pastor is gonna come and we'll celebrate communion together. Let me pray. Father, thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. We receive it and we thank you for it in your name. Amen.